<laughs> okay, so we have Fo here from Think Solo. Thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah, um, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, could you give us an overarching view or almost like an elevator pitch of what it is that I think Sono do and go into the details of what your pro the problem that you're solving? Okay. So uh, we're a healthcare company mm. and what we do is currently we're working on everyone likes to use AI, although in our company, there's a, there's a joke about that. If you ever say AI on Slack, there's an instant like automatic message that says you have to drink a shot whenever you say that. It's a, it's a meaningless term. And anyone who studies machine learning knows it's a meaningless term. But anyway, the funniest thing is when people say AI slash machine learning, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what, seriously? Like, just it just kind of becomes a key word on, on LinkedIn or on the internet. Like, but anyway, so yeah, so we're an AI company. Um, which means that we're, we're using image processing in our case for ultrasound. So we try to make ultrasound um, very user-friendly for non-experts. So nursing staff, junior doctors, general practitioners, those people. Because with ultrasound is one of the most common imaging modality med uh, modalities in medicine. Mm. So you to assess a various, many, many, many different problems. Yeah. Um, and it currently, uh, they're becoming very, very inexpensive. So for example, there's a company called Butterfly Networks. They released a handheld ultrasound machine mm. that costs something like $2,000. Okay. I think they're changing their price a little bit, but yeah. it's within on the low side. Yeah. If you take, put that in context, like a big expensive machine can cost $100,000. Mm. So it's, you know, orders of magnitude, small, like cheaper and the image quality is quite good. Yeah. But they still have the fundamental problem, which is you need a sonographer or a radiologist or someone who's an expert who's trained in ultrasound to be able to use it which limits your, your ability to assess loads of patients, to detect uh, conditions early, um, never mind in the developing world where they don't even have access to the staff. They might buy the technology, but they don't have access to people who can use it. So our technology uh, is, is software. We're a pure software company. But what we do is we uh, our software runs with existing machines. So it, it interprets or analyzes the ultrasound images automatically meaning that a nurse or a general practitioner or someone else can also assess conditions. Yeah. And the first one we're working on is called deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis. Right. Interesting. It's a blood clot in the leg. Okay. It, if part of it breaks loose, it goes to your lung, causes something called a pulmonary embolism, which can yeah. lead to death. Mm -hmm. And it's the number one cause of preventable hospital death in the world. Wow. So it's also like more than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS yeah. and car accidents combined yeah. as a condition, basically in terms of the number of deaths that are related to it. Mm. And um, the clinical path is really long and complicated. So for example, in the UK, you, you may spend, so you might go to your general practitioner. You, they, if they suspect you of DVT, yeah. they will send you to the emergency department. You wait for a couple of hours. We're in the UK, of course, mm. so it's gonna be a couple of hours wait. Yeah. You do a blood test, which is completely inaccurate. And then you get scanned by a, by a sonographer, for example, mm. and then you finally get your diagnosis. But the problem is something like, let's say out of 3,000 or 2,000 scans, only 100 to 200 come back positive. Yeah. So 90% of patients who get scanned approximately come back negative anyway. So not only did you waste lots of time, uh, the person doing the scans is barely picking up any DVTs anyway because yeah. they can't take the risk, right? They can't just say, oh, no, you know, you're unlikely to have it, therefore you shouldn't be scanned. You have to be scanned just to check. Mm -hmm. So with our technology, for example, a nurse can screen this patient early mm -hmm. so they don't have to go to the sonographer to get uh, scanned. Mm -hmm. And therefore um, you can save up to like 90%. Of, of people going to the sonographer to, in the radiology department. Mm -hmm. But you can also avoid something called prophylaxis. So if you, if you can't get scanned that day, uh, you might have to give the patient an anticoagulant, which, can, which has risks of bleeding. It's usually okay, but yeah. it still has a risk of bleeding. Yeah. You can avoid doing that. You can do it at 24 hour, uh, 24 seven, instead of waiting for the radiology department to be open. Mm -hmm. So basically our technology just detects these blood clots, can easily screen for them with nursing staff instead of experts that's what we do so that's, we build software that's incredible. To do that. I, I mean uh, do you have any idea of like how much the nhs europe and uh, america are kind of spending on this specific problem itself yeah so y there are different ways to analyze how much so in the uk the government estimated at least half a billion pounds are spent on on the condition in general right then you have to dig deep into what, how much they spend on scanning per se so i think 
EU, US is around $5 billion, mm. at least. Mm. Um, but there's different ways to cut that number. But it's going to be in the billions, yeah. basically. If you can avoid DVT, then you're... I mean, ju if, if you, we purely look at the cost of DVT plus a pulmonary embolism, which is what happens because mm. they're sort of connected together, mm. if you do that cost, then that's in the tens of billions. So if you can avoid a pulmonary embolism, that's amazing. But just the scanning itself is up in the billions anyway that's incredible and like in terms of like the the germ of the germ of the idea how did you come across this problem in the first place like what yeah right so we uh we're an entrepreneur first company yeah. so it was always doing entrepreneur first yeah. and i i was speaking to my co-founder in fact i met him during the the cohort yeah. and right before i met him i'd already spoken to some doctors because I was already interested in the medical space anyway mm. and what I wanted to do was solve like a big big problem in the medical space because I thought well I'm going to take a risk anyway I might as well go big yeah. and try to solve something that's worth solving in the mm. first place I really dislike marginal solutions to problems especially in the healthcare space it's already tough no one cares if you have like some marginal improvement with the processing like yeah. whatever yeah. Um, at least I wasn't interested in that um, so once I spoke to doctors they kept bringing up DVT and it was the first time I heard of it and I thought it wasn't a big deal until I looked up the numbers and just the sheer problem was so large mm. that I was shocked because I'd always heard of, you know, cancer. Cancer is a big thing in, in healthcare. It is. I mean, it's a huge problem, but you don't really hear about deep vein thrombosis or venous thromboembolism or just thrombosis in general outside yeah. of the medical world. Yeah. The medical world is well aware of this problem, mm. but just outside of it, it's not that well known. Um, so I was surprised and then once I found out about it, I started fight, like literally looking at a YouTube video on how it's diagnosed. I'm not joking. I sat down, I was yeah. watching a YouTube video on something called compression ultrasound, which is how it's diagnosed. And as I was watching it, my co-founder walked by me and he was like, hey, you know, what are you doing? Which is quite usual in the air for trying to find out what each person's doing and stuff. And I was like, you know, this DVT thing, it doesn't look that complicated. He's like, what? And he was looking at the video with me and I was like, well, you know, they're using this ultrasound machine, they're doing compressions, you know, I think it's a solvable problem. And then he was like, okay, yeah, do you want to work together? I was like, okay. So we just started working together. And he's super young. Like at the time, he hadn't technically got his like diploma yet from his, he's a German guy. Oh, he hadn't, yeah, so I was like this young German kid. Who does he think he is, you know? <laughs> I send him, I send him like some, some research papers on DVT yeah. and I'm like, okay, go read them. Come back to me if you read them, assuming he's not going to do it. Mm. And then he did read them and like already had analyzed the information and got the point, wow. which I thought, I just thought he's so quick mm. at learning it. Mm. But yeah, I, then we started working together. We met doctors. We then employed radiologists. We then got, you know, the best hematologists we could find. We have some at Oxford, guys in St. Thomas's. Mm. So we then really built like a really good team. And then we ended up meeting um, the guy who invented the, the diagnosis itself. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So like, yeah. I thought he was going to look at me and be like, nah, like this is a nice approach, but this is never going to work. Yeah. No, he was, he was like, yeah, no, this makes sense. Yeah. You should do it. Yeah. So my biggest shock, actually, it was interesting. Our biggest shock is when we entered the healthcare system or like tried to work within the healthcare system, the gap between... So there are three components. There's people funding healthcare. Mm. Then there are people who practice healthcare. So yeah. like doctors and all the actual clinicians. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have the patients as well. And then you have um, uh, the people building technology for healthcare. Mm. And none of them understand each other at all. Like they're super lost. Okay. So if you talk to a GP, if you talk to just a junior doctor on the NHS today, mm they're not going to really understand the structure of the NHS, how funding works, why things cost. They don't even know how much things cost usually, just on average. I mean, there are people who are more aware than other people, but that this is, was my experience, that they, they understand their own field really well. They, they don't have time to understand everything. Context. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge yeah. context. So with the people who pay or manage hospitals, they don't usually understand what's really going on on the granular. They rely on the doctors to tell them basically what's happening, mm. but they don't really understand necessarily how to improve things. Yeah. It depends on the person you talk yeah. to. Um, when it comes to like VCs and healthcare providers, so, sorry, people provide. So let's say if we stick to just people building healthcare technology, usually they don't have any clinicians on their teams. Mm. Like it's crazy to me. Mm. Like we were speaking to see some people who are, let's say, senior in ultrasound. Mm. And they didn't understand that DVT was a big problem. 
which was shocking to me. Yeah. Because I was like, okay, how the, one of the things your technology is used for is this thing. That's yeah. why it's bought. It's yeah. used to be able to assess this thing. Mm. But you don't really understand the, the, the application very well. You understand the technology really well. You understand pricing and how to do sales, but you don't really understand what it's used for. Mm. Um, at least not on a very deep level, maybe surface level. Maybe they're aware that it's used for X, Y, and Z, but they're not really aware of the details, yeah. which I thought was quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, so what you find is that there's a massive sort of education process with everyone you talk to. Mm. That's, what, that's what you end up seeing. Mm. Um, but from a patient standpoint, have you kind of noticed a specific... Um, discontent or like have you spoken to enough patients that have gone through the traditional route um yeah you know, through being diagnosed with dvt and um what what has been their experience and like what are you trying to create from a patient standpoint as well like so so in the end that you have the the patient should be the the, the, the most important individual for any healthcare company mm -hmm. because in the end the patient's going to be the one treated right yeah and that shouldn't be just some sort of platitude you say, because I also know lots of healthcare companies say that as a nice little platitude yeah. if you don't really do that. But anyway, so yeah, so that from a, a patient experience point of view, they, it's just the, the time it takes is really long. Yeah. But also, look, here's the thing. It's really many patients, at least the people that come to us and they say, oh, my dad had a DVT, right? Yeah. And we were so lucky that it got caught. Mm -hmm. Well, the sad part is, what about the person where the DVT wasn't caught? Yeah. Well, they died, right? Yeah. So for them, it's a very binary thing. If the technology exists, it's amazing for patients. That's just full stop. It's also really safe because it's exactly what they do today. They do ultrasound scans for DVT, right? We're not like reinventing the wheel. And um, we're just making it easier to do the same scan. Yeah. So, so from a, a patient perspective, we even had, um, f in order to run one of our studies, we're planning a clinical trial soon, I hope. Um, and they, they went to patient groups. So at Oxford University Hospital, we're working with them. And they went with patient groups in order to assess how much they, they like it. And I think something like 80% plus mm. thought it's amazing that this is what they want. Mm. So for patients, I think it's very obvious. The, the, we never have problems convincing patients or honestly doctors that this is a good idea. Yeah. It's more about... Um, the, the real complexity comes with funding, actually, and then integration. Because people are going to wonder, okay, if I use this technology, whenever you change a clinical pathway in any way, whenever you introduce anything in the healthcare system, yeah. a lot of components are connected, yeah. and you're sort of disconnecting and rewiring the system to be better. Yeah. But that initial pain of rewiring it has to be worth it for the end goal. Otherwise, people don't want to use your technology. Yeah. One question we got, got asked in the US recently is what about reimbursement? If I use this tech, am I going to get paid or not? Like just fundamentally. Yeah. And the answer is we hope yes, because there's, you know, um, there are ways to pay for it with the current healthcare system structure. We have to think a lot about how, how these service providers, how these hospitals can actually pay to use our technology. Mm. And that's, a, that's probably the most neglected aspect of all of healthcare technology today in every Every healthcare company I've either helped out or like talked to or looked at their presentation, the, the, the number one alarm bell you should, if, if they don't mention reimbursement, they don't understand what they're talking about yet. Interesting. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah. I want to touch on that later on, but the, the other one, the, the, the perspective I wanted to talk about was your technology specifically. Now, so um, your technology can diagnose DVT, um, just as good as a clinician? That's what we want to show in the clinical trials. That's what you want to show in the clinical yeah. trials. And we, we're quite confident because yeah. it does the same thing. Mm. They're not, it's not doing anything different. Yeah. So it should be what they call non-inferior, mm. which means that there is the same likelihood of DVT, at least not being missed, because that's the biggest problem. You can't, I mean, if you, if you miss a DVT, then it can cause a polymer embolism and then the patient can die. So it can't miss one. Mm. But or at least statistically, it shouldn't be, be missing more than the, the, more than the expert. Yeah. And that's what we want to show in our clinical studies. Yeah. I mean, for somebody that's not in the healthcare sector, I mean, what is the regulatory pathway for a company like yours? So I think the, the, the issue is today, the software in general isn't well, uh, within the health, uh, regulatory framework, isn't super well established, mm -hmm. as in it's the regulatory bodies are usually a couple of years behind t the technology. Mm -hmm. 
which sort of makes sense because you know they're either either in, uh, either national or supranational, like the U, like the EU yeah. or the US, for example, has their own. Those are the big ones: CE and FDA. Mm -hmm. Those are two regulatory sort of approvals you need in general. And yeah. if you're accepted in those two, you're fine basically. Um, but they, what they really fundamentally want to find out are two things. A, is your technology safe? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But if you make a claim about it, you have to prove that with evidence. Mm. The second point you have to, um, you have to go through uh, is to show that um, th there are these classes that you have to go through, for example, in CE marking. So for example, if you have a pacemaker, they might consider that a class three device because it's, you know, it's, it's monitoring your heart. Mm. But the and, and, and it's about risk. So if it fails, what are you doing to make sure it doesn't, you know, or, or to make sure that it's very, very rare when that happens. That's just what you have to prove to them. Mm. But fundamentally, to do that, you just have to do the appropriate studies and stuff. And then it doesn't really matter exactly what the, there is a class three, for example, the highest class in CE marking or class two or class one or whatever. It sort of naturally comes out based on how much, what what the claims are and how well you do your studies and how well you build your product. Naturally, if your product is something that can, um, like ours, for example, there are different versions of the product that we want to release onto the market, which have different claims. Interesting. Yeah, so you don't necessarily jump so, you know, from day one into, okay, we're going to diagnose DVT. Everyone in the UK should be using this technology immediately. Don't worry about the radiologist. Like, that would be stupid. Yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. You start very slowly. You introduce... Say you, you make one claim about the technology, which is still helpful, yeah. just maybe not full diagnostic, and that's what most healthcare companies mm -hmm. do. They, and then slowly, as you build up your evidence, and, it's, and you know for sure that it's you know, hitting all the milestones, then you sort of update your regulatory claims, and then you get approvals for different versions of it. That's in software. But remember, in hardware, it's like different, right? If you have a pacemaker, maybe there aren't any versions. You have one. Mm -hmm. You know, so you might have to jump into class three yeah. immediately. That's really interesting. So yeah. initially, your technology will be to augment the initial clinician or the radiologist. Yeah. And yeah. then eventually, hopefully, as the technology gets better and better. And exactly. Better, you may not need them at yeah. the end. For example, you can have a version of it where there's a double check at the end, mm. but it's still faster than the current pathway. This is when you have your, the conversations are a mix between conversations with clinicians and payers and providers who provide the service. Mm. And then you try to sort of, map out with them the different versions of the technology and this can go with ours it can go with anyone and then you want to see like at which point is it useful and then at which point is it super useful and then like amazing basically and then you want to make your claims based on that but it is tricky it's an ongoing conversation it's not like one day we didn't just sit one day and decide okay this is the final version it's an ongoing conversation based on what the technology can actually do yeah. and how useful it is for the clinicians and then um yeah like uh, and then you also consider like actually like legally how 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 difficult is this to actually get into the market how much money do you need to do this because your your investors will also want to ask you like okay Fine, I get your your little idea about these versions is good, but like, how expensive is yeah, this, yeah. and how long is it going to take? Because if this is going to take a decade, it doesn't yeah, matter because they're, they're not going to fund it anyway. Mm -hmm. So this is when actually really, it's really this is where it's so key to have as a as a startup to have the right investors on board. Um, we'll touch on the invest investors in a bit. I mean, I was just really curious. I mean, I don't I don't think it's hard to figure out, you know what you're training your data set on. I mean, well, essentially... Well, ultrasound. Yeah. Ultrasound. Actually, our data set is super weird because... Really? Every... So, i tell you what. This is what um, imaging startups usually do. There's some database in a hospital somewhere. Yeah. It's going to be common. It's going to be thousands, if not millions of images. Yeah. They're going to be static images. Mm -hmm. And if they're really lucky, they're already labeled. So, mm -hmm. a lot of breast cancer screening people do this. It's mm -hmm. already, like, millions of images everywhere because it's a standard it's process. It's already labeled. If you're really lucky, really? otherwise you have to label it yourself. That's that's a big job. That's a big job. Did you have to label it yourself? Yeah, we did. Jesus Christ! But we didn't even have. We didn't even have. We don't even use images per se. We use video. Video. Because yes. ultrasound is is a yeah. real time sort of thing. It's not just one picture and that's wow. it. That doesn't mean anything. Okay. So we had a our problem is like an order of magnitude more difficult than the other. That's okay. why you might notice lots of radiology like healthcare startups who do yeah. ai yeah. they don't do ultrasound you'll just just look at them just check all of them out yeah. there are very few ones that do ultrasound i know the ones that do there's like three or four in the world yeah. that do it and it's because it's a massive headache it's yeah. like not an easy it's 
if it wasn't such a huge, if DBT in particular wasn't such a huge problem, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have bothered to attempt this problem. It's yeah. just too too like complicated technically to, to solve as a as an issue. But because it's such a huge mm -hmm. um, medical issue, yeah. we think it's worth. And we're also quite advanced now. We know how to do it. But it took us three years to really figure out, like collect the data manually. We flew out our radiologist to Germany to scan people. We had med this medical students labeling, like it's, we had several countries involved. Like, yeah, like it's, it's not, it was not an easy task. It's actually one of the reasons our investors were a little bit impressed because they were like, wow, okay, yeah. you, you went I international imagine. very early. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask you, I'm like, is there anything down the stack you just wish had been done for you? I guess it would be the labeling. But yeah, just, the data, yeah. man, that was, it's awful because you have to do so much. Yeah. But at the same time, like we even built our own labeling pipeline. Like, my co-founder is really good. Wow. We don't trust anyone with any other tech. Yeah. We don't trust external people. We just build all of it ourselves. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, so everything's built from scratch on our own. Like, um, so even the way the students label is invented by us. Like we have a particular way of doing it. It's incredible. Yeah, the, the protocol to collect the data is also mm. by us. Yeah. We came up with it. So like, uh, and because it's so catered for our specific use case and our specific technology, mm. everything sort of ends up working seamlessly. Yeah. You don't have to rely on any other, one, uh, any other people to like give you any data or give you whatever, because we do it all on our own. We don't have to ask. Um, obviously, ask for consent and stuff yeah. when you, you collect it, but there, are, there is no third party really. Yeah. It's just us and the hospital and our process and, and we fund it ourselves so there's no like external stuff that we have to rely the on the accuracy of your data set is likely to be far orders of magnitude much better than yeah. a company that's doing something similar but like just using a picture oh yeah it can't, they yeah. can't even do it, it yeah. with just a picture it's too it's temporal you need time information so you can't even do it yeah. that's why it's complicated mm. is there anything else down the stack you just wish was done for you I mean, it's all in the fun as well to build it yourself, right? It's, it's part of it. All I would say is, um, yeah, so I, I guess not really. I'm, I'm fine with, with yeah. just it. I guess when we started this company, our expectations were this is going to be super tough. Mm. Like, just don't expect any support yeah. whatsoever <laughs> and just do it anyway. What was your thinking around using the uh, ultrasound video? And like, what, did you realize at the beginning you needed time-related data? Yeah, we had suspicions about that. We had to experiment a lot. We, had, we have amazing machine learning engineers, a lot of them from Imperial College London. Mm. So, um, and we discussed multiple ways to attack the problem. Mm. And so obviously that was one approach, but it takes a long time to, because it's, look, it's experimentation. The problem with machine learning, it's not predictable. Mm. It's not very well predictable. You have, to, you have to experiment and see what works best. And so we went through many, many, many different iterations on a different approach to, the, to solve the problem. Mm. And then we ended up with the solution we have now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, t in terms of um, product, I mean, what have you learned across this journey when it comes to building up your products? Obviously, you figured out uh, the labeling thing would have been, you know, yeah. it's, it's crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, but you figured that out at the beginning. Throughout this process, I mean, what have you learned about building products and acquiring good feedback? So, never trust any instinct or intuition you have. Interesting. Yeah, never. I, I don't care sort of what any, any, my opinion or my team's opinion. I just care about the final user, what they say. Yeah. And we have, again, we, there's, there are approaches to do this. For example, we have nursing staff. We used to have at least nursing staff coming to the office and, and, and scanning volunteers because we wanted to see whether our, our fundamental, we have assumptions, but we yeah. just test assumptions all the time. So they come in, they, they use these handheld machines we have with our software to guide them to pr perform this exam to see if it works. Mm -hmm. And then we have radiologists like checking if this is, actually makes sense and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and all we, we're just completely quiet. We don't even, we barely want to give them any information because we want to see how does the user interact with the technology with as little input from us as possible mm -hmm. And then do it in such a way where they intuitively use the technology without, with, just just by the mere mere way of, or the mere fact that it's built that way. It's built to be intuitive for the end user, not necessarily for us. And there is a distinction there because as soon as you use any sort of technology, you get used to it, and then you think it's natural the way it's working. But yeah. someone else doesn't necessarily think so, yeah. especially if they're not. Say if they're older than you but you assume they're young. That's, that's just the basic assumption. You just won't think because you're young. And then if there's someone old, you assume they're going to use technology the same way you do. They don't. Mm. Um, 
The best example I can give, think about your parents using a laptop versus an iPad. Why is the laptop complicated? It's really not. Like, it's, I, to me, it's so intuitive to use a laptop. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated as to my dad's inability to use it. Because I'm like, dude, it's like you have the buttons, you have the screen, the thing tells you what to do. Where's the complexity? <laughs> give him an iPad and he sort of gets it. Yeah. Even then, sometimes it depends on the parent, right? But sometimes, like, so it's, it's interesting to watch what, what's confusing. Yeah. Because it's so big, it could be like the most basic thing. Like, they don't understand if there's a cross. For example, you know, we're, we're used to these, okay, you go online, if there's a cross, what does it mean? You close the application, right, in general. Yeah, some people don't get that point. They don't realize the cross means close. And it's like when my dad asks me, what does that mean? I'm like, well, you know, it means closing. He's like, how do you know? I'm like, I don't know, because it's always, it's <laughs> always like this. It's yeah. across the internet. <laughs> He, he confuses what the internet is yeah. versus like the iPad. <laughs> so he doesn't know that it's not inside of it. It's like outside or yeah. Wi-Fi, what yeah. Wi-Fi, you know. So I guess my point is when you're building products, you can't, you just can't make, if you make assumptions, be very clear about what they are. Mm. And you might make people upset because look, remember you have a team. And they think, you're, they think you're an idiot sometimes, at least my team, because I'll be like, yeah, but how do we know they know how to press this button? And they're like, because it's red and it's right in front of you. Mm. Um, and I'm like, well, we need to test it. Mm. And then slowly over time, though, to be fair, they fell into the same sort of way of thinking because they, they saw, like, personally how people struggle and like, okay, yeah, we can't make these assumptions anymore. Yeah. This is actually goes back to machine learning, heavily, heavily into machine learning because um, unless you're doing real-time prospective testing, mm -hmm. not retrospective, which is another thing that people do. So this is what they do. They take some data, they do an analysis, they have an output, which usually says, this thing's super accurate because we looked at this historical data in the past and we can predict some tests that we haven't seen before, yeah. right? That's not necessarily, uh, in my view, very robust. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are different designs to test technology, maybe it applies, mm -hmm. but in my view, it's a sort of nice, but can I see it work in real life? So in our case, for example, we didn't even bother doing that. So for example, we, what we did was scan the, unless I see a person being scanned, and I know it's working in that particular individual, yeah. I don't really care what numbers they throw at me yeah. because it doesn't matter. Mm. What matters is the final product where the nurse is scanning the patient and knows what happens. Mm. That's what matters. So it's prospective, it's live. Yeah. And this you can, I mean, this is in particular difficult with ultrasound because you, you, can't, you can't really do retrospective very well anyway. Mm. People who do like images, like if yeah. you're doing, if you apply machine learning to some image, mm. um, it might work better. But again, like, you know, the biggest controversy was like this biasing of these algorithms where demographics make a difference. Yeah. So for example, if you're detecting faces and your data set happens not to have any brown or black faces in it and then it messes up, and if, it's because you didn't do prospective scans, you know, yeah. necessarily, like you just didn't consider these biases. Yeah. So with machine learning, it's like difficult sometimes to understand that where are the edge cases? Like, when is it going to fail? Because you'll get nice numbers. You can always get nice numbers. It just doesn't mean anything in real life. You have to really check in real life in a proper study with taking into account all the biasing. Did Sounds really boring, but you have to Did you come across ma many edge cases with your technology? Because essentially yeah. you're trying to test one single thing, right? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. So Tell you one example, yeah. if you're fat, <laughs> not to be rude, but like, it's a problem. But everyone knows that, and it's just difficult to do it. The images aren't very good. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's not nothing against the, the person, no, like. But you know. no, but like if somebody was slightly overweight, that it would be it would. Not it slight. Would, to be fair, it's usually like very obese. obese. Yeah, yeah, if somebody was clinically obese, it'd yeah. be very difficult to um, acquire the. Even life. for the radiologists, even really? for the expert, yeah, wow. they have to use Doppler and other. Like they have to then. They might not even be able to use ultrasound. I mean, in rare cases, usually it's okay. I'm just saying, like, that, That's interesting. and remember who, who's your patient group, mm. like, Every human you know. Group, yeah. <laughs> so it depends. It depends on, and, and, and I mean, quite, we're quite rigorous. We know like that's going to be the case, and so you have to. All you need, what you really need to do a lot is like measure where where are the push your technology to the edge and see where the edge cases are, at least at that point, it's fine if it doesn't work for everyone. Okay. That's not the problem. You yeah. just have to know who it doesn't work for. Mm -hmm. That's like the important yeah. thing. I mean, well, what, um, what strands of diversity did you kind of have to 
a diversity when it what strands of diversity did you really have to push into when it comes to testing your technology like diversity really has to play a major part in you know ac accumulating your data set right what do you mean by diverse? Diversity. So, I mean, you said different you, bodies. Yeah, for different. I mean, yeah, different like dif different there. ages and different, different body ages. sizes. Okay. Yeah, ethnicity doesn't make a difference. Yeah, but the, the size ethnicity. of the body and yeah, the as, as, as we wanted to have as varied of a data set as possible yeah. because we wanted to see um, does it work across the board. You yeah. know, we know there are limitations in the end. There is yeah. a point where it's not going to work in any case. Mm. But um, for now, it's worked pretty well. Yeah. I would say. So the, the other question I wanted to ask was, um, right. how does a healthcare company like yours make money? Now, it sounds like a... It's a great it's question. Like, is it a great question? Yeah. I thought it was a stupid Why? question. Why? <laughs> it's a great... It's about, uh, number yeah. one question I get asked by investors all the time. Yeah. You make money because if you have enough of... Um, you have to... Uh, and who, usually, who do you have to sell to in order to make money? That's a great question. It's hospitals, usually. Yeah, licensing costs. So hospitals pay a license fee to use our software. Mm. They get paid by either insurance providers or CCGs in the UK. That that's the idea anyway. The the problem actually with that question is it's a it's a great question. It's just with with healthcare, you you have different strategies actually to commercialize the technology. You should you shouldn't just have one way. Just hospitals. That's it. No one else. You know. You should be able to have different ways because. There's a chicken and egg problem where you need to be certified mm. before you can really have those conversations with payers. Because as soon as, if I go to a CCG today or an insurance provider who usually pays for services and I'm like, we have this amazing technology, it's going to do X, Y, and Z. They're like, great, come back to us when it's actually Done. finished. Yeah. Then we can have the conversation. Yeah. So it's, they're not quite like that. We've already had some. That's mm. why I have ideas about how to do this. Yeah. But the point is, is that they're not going to just give you like a signed piece of paper saying we're definitely going to pay for it this way. You have to make some assumptions about, and also it changes. Remember, like it's not static. They also change on how they pay, especially now that AI is becoming actually used mm -hmm. in clinical practice. Yeah. Usually in any healthcare system, there's a code associated with any service. So with DVT ultrasound scans, there's a code on the NHS. Yeah. There's a code in the US. Mm -hmm. If you get a, a Operation, there's a code. If you get knee replacement, there's a code for that. Yeah. And then hospitals bill their payers, insurance providers, or like the government basically, based on how many of these processes or procedures they perform. That's starting to change, but in general, that's how it runs. So, in a simplistic way, you just have to have a code or you have to attach yourself to a code that already exists so that they have a way to pay you, they have a way to measure how much value you, your service provides. Okay. Here's the key bit. It's changing in the sense that in the past, what a lot of healthcare companies did and a lot of like, um, especially big companies, what they relied on is what they called pay per use or pay, pay for the service each yeah. time. But because of healthcare costs going so far up, mm. what there are, especially the US is really pushing this. They're saying you have to provide value-based healthcare. We're not going to just pay you because you scanned a thousand people. Because yeah. what if that's just a waste of time? You yeah. shouldn't be scanning all of those people. Mm. There are some people you shouldn't be scanning. Mm. So we want to pay you based on patient outcomes. So how well, like if this was required. Yeah. And that's changing the game economically. That's incredible. Because yeah. it puts more load on the, on the healthcare companies. Yeah. I don't mind that, to be honest, because I think you should provide value and you yeah. shouldn't just do so, like scans or something just for the sake of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in, in terms of, um, I, I remember I spoke to a couple of VCs um, and they said in 2005, six and seven, if, they're, if, they're, if a health tech company's plan involved selling into the NHS, they'd just rip it up and just not speak to the family. Really? Yeah, it was because, because it, it was really difficult to introduce your technology in that type of environment, especially 2005, six, seven, eight, yeah. because, because there was old legacy systems. That's true. And, yeah. and a lot the NHS were tied up in 10 year contracts with, uh, these, yeah. with IBM and a lot of these big yeah. uh, companies. Now, now we're kind of experiencing a kind of a shift now. So it we're is, seeing, yeah. we're seeing the top down healthcare system isn't working now. and what the the system and the model that actually works is uh, one that re revolves around the patient so like now we're beginning to see more adoption of technology within the nhs and nhsx is and supposed to do all yeah, of that right yeah. there's a whole like department now mm, that's yeah. supposed to just help like companies like ours small startups and innovative companies yeah. to sell into the nhs yeah. how have you seen like the technologies like yours um uh from a regulatory standpoint i mean have there been any hindrances and what, what do you wish uh was much better 
clarity. Interesting. Okay. It's more just about clarity from the regulatory bodies and the hospitals. Okay. Just tell us how we can approach you better. Mm. Tell us and have a dedicated person mm. because the problem with, with these big, I mean, remember, these are big systems, right? They're dealing with millions of people, so it's sort of expected. But in any big system, if you don't have a very good point of entry in the NHS, trying to do that with NHS X, that's, mm. I think, their idea to, yeah. is to do that. And other healthcare systems are sort of trying to push it. But in general, it's very legacy driven. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so usually startups, for example, they have to interact with so many. Remember, the lifetime of a startup is very short relative to the speed by which hospitals operate. Mm. So for a hospital, you know, by the time they schedule an appointment, they're like, you know what, come back to us in three months. We have an appointment for you then. Mm. If you're at EF, the company's life is six months. Yeah. Your investors are expecting an update every month. Mm. And the meeting set is for the next three months. And that meeting then gets rescheduled for another month. And then you meet the person who says, yeah, that's very interesting. Let's talk in another month. Mm. So then you've wasted like six months. Nothing's actually happened in that time. Mm. But you as a company have burned through like, say, I don't know, it depends on how much you're spending a month. Say you're spending a very low amount, 10,000 pounds a month. Mm. Six months, that's 60,000 pounds. Yeah. If you're a tiny startup with two people, this is a problem. Yeah. Like, Almost yeah, that's like yeah. an angel investor's entire <laughs> check. <laughs> Basically, just funding yeah. your lifestyle, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Like, yeah. my point is, is this is sort of the issue, right? Mm. Now, it's not really, that you, you know, can't really blame anyone per se for it. It's a big system. Um, but you, as a startup, have to find ways around it. And that's what I wish would just stop. Like, I just wish decisions were done quicker mm. because a lot of them are obvious decisions. It's just the person isn't available or there's no exact person who makes the final call. Mm. I would say the biggest thing, though, is payers. They should be involved. Because I think everyone's sort of talking, but the payers aren't really talking to anyone. Mm. CCGs, I haven't had a single meeting with CCG yet. Mm. I mean, I spoke to some people related to them, so I don't want to say, like, nothing. Mm. But, like, they are very weirdly hard to talk to. Mm. And I would imagine insurance providers, other people in this space, should be much more active. They shouldn't just leave it for everything and then things go bad or things go well and then they jump in last minute. Mm. They should be engaging from the very beginning because like, like, like you mentioned, selling is such a big point. Yeah. Like, like think about it from both the hospital and the investor's perspective and the people building the tech. Mm. All of them are basing on the assumption that this thing's economically viable. Yeah. And the number one sort of, the number one uh, organization to decide this is the payer, mm. it's the insurance provider or the CCG. Mm. If they're not involved in the conversation at the beginning, and if, so, if then the technology ends up costing a lot more, you could have saved a lot of people a lot of time and they could have maybe changed it, right? Yeah. They could have changed the way they build whatever technology they build to make it more cost effective mm -hmm. if only the conversation came in earlier. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's quite sad because it affects patients, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine you're trying to develop a drug and you spend 10 years developing it and it's really good and it works, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then you end up finding out, no, the NHS is not going to pay for it because it's too expensive. Yeah. Why would you develop the next drug? Yeah, you you're not. not. You're just not going to develop the next yeah. drug. You're going to be like, oh, we're just going to stick to the same drugs we have. Who's going to lose? The patient. Yeah. Well, what yeah. technical nuances have you, like, throughout this journey, you, you've, you've spoken to a lot of VCs. Mm -hmm. What technical nuances have they failed to understand or grasp in your opinion? Oh, I don't even bother explaining the tech. No. Don't you? No. And there, you do, there was one VC. It was very interesting. They tried to do tech due diligence on us, mm. on my... Like, we have lectures at Imperial College working for us, right? So this yeah. is, like, super advanced people. Yeah. And they, I remember they brought in this guy who didn't know what he was talking about, like, wasn't... Didn't even know the tech itself. Yeah. He's trying to do due diligence. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, we could do due diligence on you. Like, I can ask you questions and you won't even have the answer for. Mm. So, like, it's... It's like you said, it, it, there are, this is a particular European thing. They have people from finance, usually, um, who come in into VC, who aren't experienced VCs, who haven't started and exited businesses themselves, which it doesn't mean they're going to be bad VCs, by the way. It's just, I think statistically, that means that quite a few of them aren't just going to be, they're not supposed to be in this VC world, right? And the questions, it's based on the questions they ask, you know that the person is not on the same level as you. That we're not discussing the same thing. And you learn that, like, I didn't learn that at the beginning. I suppose that's another thing I, I ended up learning is, is how to engage with these sorts of people because, and, and what, what you start to do as an entrepreneur is just based on very, like one phone call or one meeting, you decide whether or not you bother with the VC. And I've had pushback on this. 
Like I had serious pushback from my own team. There was a VC that ended up sending us so many questions via email and I had alarm bells going off because I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like these questions are too detailed for such an early stage company. And um, why though? Like, isn't that great? Like, you would think, you would think because you, you get it through experience because it's counterintuitive. If they ask too many questions for that stage, it's not the questions that are bad. It's the stage and what type of questions. To give you an example, I would never ask an early stage healthcare company what's going to happen in four years time, the exact regulatory pathway, exactly like which and which code they're going to run on. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't do that is not because it's a bad question. It's because I know for a fact he's going to come up with an answer mm -hmm. that isn't going to be true. There is no point like a bad answer that is not better than no answer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very basic like cognitive bias that you want to hear stuff that makes the story sound. I mean, I realized this later. It's, it's honestly, it's just not really their fault. It's human biases. The basic human bias is that you want a nice story so you can justify the investment to yourself. Mm. That's why they're asking. Mm. They're not asking because it really makes sense. Yeah. In the same way when you have like a VC that wants a detailed revenue projections. Really? Okay, so let's go back to if you want to be really scientific about it. How many revenue projections are correct? Probably none or very few, unless you're a very big company, again, because they come from a world where they're well-established companies with clear revenue projections and the changes are maybe a couple of percent a year, which matters, Yeah. right? And then they go into the startup VC world and you have a bunch of people trying to build some transformative tech. Like imagine asking Mark Zuckerberg how, how big face, Facebook's going to be when he first started off with just, un, just integrated within university systems. I can even imagine the market analysis. Well, you know, it's only a couple of universities in the world. Why would this face thing work? Mm. Because they couldn't even imagine your grandfather's going to use it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's the same thing that early stage. What you really want to see is, is there potential in this thing? Does it work? Um, is the problem big enough? Just generally. Like in our case, it's very easy. Is DVT a problem? Yes. Is diagnosing DVT an issue? Yes. Does this technology have the potential to solve the diagnostic issue of DVT? Yes. Those three questions should be, more or less enough to carry you like halfway through and then the rest of the details about how you like what does the technical it? due diligence look like for a company like yours because I more mean, basic than you think yeah, really <laughs> yeah it's pretty basic do they not just take, check out your technology depends on the VC depends on them they're really okay, look how are they going to check we're doing stuff that's not even published in papers who's yeah. checking but look they do check in the sense that if they speak to the lecturer who writes the papers and they can read papers, publish papers on this, yeah. and which is peer reviewed and we're publishing more papers. Mm -hmm. We're a weird case where we're particularly rigorous. Like we actually have the stuff, you know, but if someone's trying to sit down and like look at our code, good luck. Like, because if you're that good, you should be building the company yourself. Like if you're that good. Now, what they really do in due diligence is to just find out, is this fake or not? You know, that's really the basic. It's like, does, it, it, does this even, it's like fraud prevention almost. Yeah. There is a level of trust you have to have with the person you're talking to. Does this guy know Elizabeth Holmes? Is that, that, that's what they're trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, see, okay, that's interesting. She really screwed us over. <laughs> okay, so Elizabeth Holmes. I knew that stuff was BS from the very beginning I saw that because as soon as I was- I bought into it. Did you? That's <laughs> yeah. crazy. I, because I, so, okay, at the time she was doing stuff like to do with microfluidics, which I studied at university, yeah. like a little bit, I knew a little bit about it. Anyway, so as soon as the article came out and I think someone asked, like there was, this is before it was a massive controversy. It was already starting, but it wasn't yeah. as big as now. Um, and I remember I sent it to another friend of mine at Imperial College and I was like, this is rubbish. Like she can't do that. She, her, her someone asked, asked her, how does the tech work? And she was like, well, you know, it's a chemical reaction. And I was like, for, cause she's doing the blood test, yeah. right? Stuff, right? And I was like, not a single university on the planet together have tr been able to do what she's claiming she's able to do. Yeah. Like, including my, I went to Southampton. Southampton has a whole like nanotech microfluidics department. We haven't been able to do it. Harvard, what are Stanford, universities? I think we're... no one's been able to, to, no one had. So I was like, it's a very easy due diligence process. Speak to one professor at one university and ask them one question. Is this feasible? And their answer is going to be no. But they didn't do that. And it's because if you look at who was on her board and who, who the people were. Yeah, there were and no scientific people on the board. Not really. You know, yeah. Henry Kissinger was like an yeah. army general. Right? Yeah. And, and, but yeah. it's super interesting because a lot of the investment world is based on this sort of thing where you have people who aren't necessarily strictly. In, and honestly, it causes problems. So you have people who aren't into the, really into the space. Um, but other people jump in because they respect them because they're in another space. So let's say you're um, 
ex-banker, amazing ex-banker, hyper intelligent, and you invested in a company, your other ex-banker friends will also want to invest in that company. That doesn't mean it's a good company. It just depends on the company. Um, in healthcare in particular, you need serious expertise to understand. Like very few people, there are people, for example, that we've spoken to, which is like a breath of fresh air, because you can see the conversations like immediate understanding of what, what's happening. So th those are, some investors are quite good at getting just the right people. And other investors, especially the humble ones, they know who to rely on, you know? So they'll speak to like, um, you know, a healthcare specific VC, even if they're like a series A, even a series B one. But they'll just ask them to assess this company because they'll have doctors on board. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Let's go into our quick fire round. All right, good. Yeah. Um, most valuable purchase under a hundred pounds? Uh, it's probably some sort of subscri sub subscription online, I can imagine. Um, maybe Don't Amazon Prime. <laughs> Amazon Prime. <laughs> Actually, I hate buying stuff online, yeah. but I did pay for it because I wanted to watch some TV shows. Super valuable. I've been watching, okay, everyone's, oh, everyone watched House MD already, right? But I'm late to the game and I've been like binging on it. So. You're binging on it now. Damn. Yeah. Um, a book that you'd give to a fellow startup founder? Uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Interesting. So many people have mentioned that book. Yeah. It's genius. Mm. Um, most valuable advice you've received throughout this journey? Um, okay, I didn't actually receive this advice. I had a friend who received this advice from another investor okay. and I took it to heart as well. And he said, and this is only during fundraising because it, you really, I mean, you, you're you start questioning your own, you know, you, you lose your confidence because you can only get rejected so many times before you start questioning whether or not you're in the yeah. right game, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he said about investors, and he was an investor himself, he said, you know, remember you're the rock star, not them. You're the one that's building. I mean, he was talking about entrepreneurs, I guess, in general, mm -hmm. about you're the one that's actually having to build all this stuff. And these people, as big and pompous as they seem, at least some of them, you know, they have the money and they have the nice website and all of that. Remember, you're the person that's actually got the power, not them, because they need to deploy that money somewhere. And you're that vehicle, which is going to give them return. So in the end, they're all relying on you to pull this off. And it's just to remember that, like, they're all like supporting you in this journey you're going on, but like you're the main character that's moving things forward. And I think some entrepreneurs, oh, it's supposed to be a quick fire round. Hey, hey, come here. Uh, yeah, some entrepreneurs, I think, almost rely too heavily on other people's opinion. Mm. I think it's so detrimental. I think investors that provide advice on things that they have no business providing advice on is detrimental because it, on, like a lot of CEOs in the startup space are in an emotionally fragile state. Yeah. Like, yeah. These guys are just, try, they, yeah. they are worn down. <laughs> it's like in the trenches. They're, they're, they're in, in the trenches. trenches. <laughs> they're in the trenches. And then they have, this, they, have this, they have this inferiority complex with somebody that's never built any healthcare technology yeah, no, and, uh, and, and never yeah. really provided any valuable advice. And then, so yeah, yeah. they're put on a different trajectory than they should be yeah. on. It's, it's, it's horrendous. I've seen so many of my friends like just... Yeah, dude, they get really sad. Yeah. yeah, they get really depressed. I mean, it's an actual problem. No one talks about depression with the entrepreneurship. Hey, great podcast. We sound all happy and stuff. Yeah. And it's all about millions in investment. But look, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you're just basically alone unless you have your co-founder with you and stuff. But you're always questioning whether or not you're doing the right thing. No one has all the answers, you know. Like you sort of... And you get surprised about that. And really, this is why it's so important to have mentors and people to support you. And they don't have to be VCs, but I was super lucky. Like, man, I was just lucky because I got some amazing people who like very honestly, some of my investors early on, I mean, now the company's doing really well and, you know, we're raising more money and it's all good. But the super early investors, like I appreciate them more every day because they came in when it was like nothing. Like we didn't have anything really. And they were just like, you know what? We like you. We're going to support you. And I remember there was one time where this round was falling apart and I was in San Francisco at the time and I was literally destroyed. Like, I was not happy. I was like, this is like, I felt sad. I was like, I'm disappointing everyone. I was super upset. And I, my investor happened to be in San Francisco as well at the time. And I went up to him and I said, you know, like I pissed this guy off and all this fell apart. And he came back to me and, and he literally looked at me. and was like, it's fine. Like, you'll be all right. Like it was, the, it was such a basic, like, like it was, he didn't do anything crazy. He just said, don't worry. We'll still be there, like you'll survive this, 
he's also an investor. So I felt like, I guess, less bad because I was like, he's also got his money in, in this thing. Like, I don't feel as bad about, you know, if it all fall apart. And then he was like, you know, it's not a problem. Like, you're, you're fine. You know, don't worry about these people. This is going to happen and we'll help you out, you know. Another investor of my angel investor ended up like connecting me to lots of other people who end up putting money in. We saved the round. It was really good. But you really need these people to like be there in the tough times, you know? Yeah. That's what you really need. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, um, have there been any like failures throughout your journey and, and building out your product that in hindsight has kind of set you off at success? Yeah. Well, we started off not even doing machine learning or imaging at all. We started trying to use lasers to detect DVT. <laughs> It's supposed to be a near infrared spectroscopy. You shine a laser through the leg, it <laughs> reflects on the light of the clot, and then I still think it's a good idea. It just wouldn't work. <laughs> I went to quantum you physics. St- you started out using lasers. I was the CTO of my co-founder, the CEO at the time. We switched. <laughs> you switched? Yeah, we switched. We switched. It was a pivot. We pivoted <laughs> to <laughs> co-founder roles. It was hilarious. Yeah, and I, I went and I even spoke to quantum physicist lecturers and stuff. And I was like, okay, okay, this is the way to do it. And he was, what a sweet guy. Like, he still went around with me, like, assuming this is going to work. And I, we went to some laser company and I was like saying, okay, you know, if we have a... Because I needed to check if it yeah. would work. Yeah. And the guy was like, looked at me and he was like, you know, I see what you're trying to do. Sounds great in theory. And then he literally put a laser on his hand. He's like, you can't even get this to reflect on your hand. Never mind on your massive leg like this. You're not going to get the information out. Mm. And then we almost shut down the company after that because I was like, well, I guess it's not a solvable problem. <laughs> but right before that, we switched again and yeah. looked at a different way to solve it, which is imaging now instead. Mm-hmm. But it was, yeah, it was quite a big failing point. Wow. Incredible. And um, what gives you the most um, relief or joy as a founder? I guess there's no relief, but like yeah. joy. No relief. <laughs> yeah. Joy. Honestly, okay, the thing that excites me the most, and this now this is a platitude if you want one, um, I know that if, when I see the technology even semi-working, like when we're doing scans, when we're doing testing and we have nursing staff using it, it's amazing. Mm. It's like this, it, it works and I, I can imagine the repercussions. Like think about it in the end, like this is all a nice story and stuff as a startup because it's not in the market, mm. but just I want to be at the stage where it's used everywhere in the world and these patients are getting get scanned, especially if they're scanned early because you can detect the clot and save someone's life. And you'll be the reason. Like, I want to walk into a hospital and see the technology used. And, I'll, and they won't know who I am, of course. And I'll be like, okay, that's like this patient, this dad, this mom, my dad, whatever, is saved because my technology was used. Like, they would detected this, this problem, which is now treatable. But um, so to me, that's really, that's the only thing I can really drive, at least personally for me, like drive me for the next God knows how many years. Um, second week of March, which is probably when we release this episode, um, are you hiring? Are there specific relationships, partnerships you're looking for? Oh, okay. Uh, we're always hiring, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. But so do reach out to me if you're interested. Um, uh, and I would say partnerships for hospitals if they're interested. Like it, I do get feedback a lot about this. We always like to talk to more hospitals. We all always like to talk to patients. Um, payers as i mentioned more than happy to talk to you guys you're <laughs> silent but yeah you should come talk to us we, we have a lot to show you i think you'll be quite excited yeah. amazing this has been a great this has been amazing thank you so much thanks so much man it was fun let's wrap it up all right that's it it's done yeah, that was, that was